Okay, scholars. Uh, I want to give you a little framework for thinking about slavery in colonial America. We're going to deal with slavery a number of times as on into the revolution. We've already dealt with it several times. And just let me give you a little bit of a framework here for understanding what I think is a, a way of thinking about it, which is to move from informal structures of slavery to a formal structure of slavery embodied in slave codes and stuff like this that bring about chattel slavery, this especially heinous form of slavery that uh, Americans developed and uh, it led into our civil war. Now, the 1619 Project is a journalist sort of like thing uh, to sort of get us thinking, which is good, and that's and uh, systematic racism is a big issue today and a lot of talk about uh, issues. And we need to just, you know, be careful with how we, we work these things through. So this is just to give us a little little start on that, all right? Now, uh, I'm not saying this is the best way to do it. I think it's a good way to do it, to think in terms of these formal and informal, this movement actually from informal to formal. The 1619 Project tends to focus on a moment where, where we really don't have clarity as to what's going on. You know, these slaves were brought here. Now, uh guy my age, you know, there's a lot of literature on all this issues. And I was really, uh, um, began, and a lot of this comes out of what is uh, Edmund Morgan, taught at Yale, and his former student, Timothy Breen. And this book, American Slavery, American Freedom, is about that paradox. How does this, how does this come about where we become these freedom-focused people at the same time as we're enslaving other people? And he then builds this story of colonial Virginia in which um, we move from indentured servanthood and ideas which are very loosely developed into more formal structures. And Tobacco Culture, I think is a great book. Tobacco Culture is basically how, um, you know, the mentality of the great tide water planters on the eve of the revolution is how a crop, a place, a crop, a, an environment creates a mentality. And uh, this planter mentality he talks about, it's a very powerful book. And it's a combination of this, that uh, in the evolution of the plantation and the tobacco culture, we get a creation of a racist slave system that becomes formalized in codes, slave codes. Let's go back to Cotton Mather. We've talked about Cotton Mather, and, and there's been some good work uh, done on Cotton Mather and his views towards slavery and his views especially toward Onesimus, who is his slave. And, and he's a way of thinking about the informality of slavery. Uh, slavery is taken for granted or not thought about fully. He's ultimately against slavery. Uh, all Christians are ultimately pro-freedom type of thing, and yet he embodies it in his, so he also has these paradoxes and stuff uh, with him. I give you, I give you one of those uh, DC comics where uh, Cotton Mather was one of the DC evil heroes, and you know, who dares to disturb Mather's prayers, right? So, uh, Mather is a slave owner, okay, and he owns Onesimus. His church gave him to him, but he he works within these humanistic, informal traditions. They are biblical traditions, going by Onesimus, of course, is a, you know, uh, Bible does not attack slavery. Slavery is what you want to get out of. And, and Paul recommends to Philemon to uh, embrace uh, Onesimus in fellowship as a brother in Christ. So it's a very complex sort of thing. But they're biblical traditions of slavery. And then there's these Aristotelian traditions, which are also within the household, within the, within the polis. And, um, and they're, uh, both of them are what you would call benign. They are trying to uh, promote uh, a type of uh, labor and social fellowship relationship, which is uh, good for the whole of society, good for uh, the person, the flourishing of the people inside, and is ultimately um, not oppressive, okay? Neither of these traditions is designed to oppress labor, okay? 
So you have those traditions and, you know, they, they're there. And then you have these indentured servanthood traditions, which um, especially coming out of Britain, an educational system, uh, especially for uh, uh, training up um, young people into uh, professions and things like that. And so, so there's indentured servanthood traditions. You sign yourself over to be a technically sort of semi-slave for a period of years in which there's supposed to be sort of a sort of reciprocal relationship. And then you have all sorts of assumptions about ethnic hierarchies. This is where the blackness does come in, uh, like with Spain and Catholics in the Mediterranean and Africa and uh, Moors and all sorts of things. But it's certainly not racism in the way 19th century especially began to develop racist theories of racial divisions, yellow, red, white, black, this sort of stuff. This, a lot of that comes out of the early anthropologies and stuff of the German universities in the 19th century. Has roots, of course, nothing is black and white or <laughs> black and white in these sort of situations, but there's a, um, uh, a real difference to racist thinking in the 19th century to the slave codes and such in the 18th century. Now, two ideas, we talked about this in the other, um, other video, is this polygenesis and the curse of Ham. For Cotton Mather, there's not either of those, okay? So he has certain ethnic ideas, uh, you know, this idea of, you know, different ethnic groups are, are lesser or greater or more vigorous or that sort of stuff. Uh, but he doesn't have an idea that there's a separate creation for blacks, something like that, or a separate creation for Indians. No, we're all humans. We're all part of this together. No curse of hand. No, nowhere God specifically has chosen one race to dominate other races or anything like that. Um, he, he has um, a much more sort of comprehensive and benign sort of traditional way of thinking. I'm not saying it's right, but it's, it's the stuff that, uh, that, uh, you know, the 18th century, especially the middle colonies and the northern colonies worked with. We talk about slavery, you know, being uh, attacked, uh, you know, or gotten rid of in, in uh, New England and in Pennsylvania, John Woolman, Cotton Mather, Samuel Sewell, these guys. And they're, they're just working out of these other traditions and largely out of a, a freedom orientation that freedom is best and slavery is bad. So you have that is an informal structure. It's, there are laws about slaves, but there's not, there's not slave codes. There's not, a, there's not a structured thinking about slavery in the way that, uh, you know, especially any sort of race-based slavery. And then ultimately you have opportunities and uh, responsibilities. Uh, education, uh, Onesimus is brought into the family. He needs to be educated like everyone else is be educated, especially to read the Bible. Uh, within the family structure, you have everybody. It's a hierarchical structure. It's patriarchy, matriarchy, parentarchy, but but at the same time, it's it's based on love. It's based on mutual uh, uh, goals of of the flourishing of the whole. And then you also have uh, you know that you're supposed to be evangelizing all these people and bringing them up into Christ. Hopefully, and then when they become especially part of the Christian fellowship, you embrace them as part of the Christian fellowship. And the goal of uh, what's best is always recognized as freedom. Okay, so let's just take this as a type of structure for, for uh, informal systems. Another way to look at the informal systems is to look at this great book, uh, you know, The Interesting and Narrative Life of Ulida Equiano, okay? Equianos, he's more of an Atlantic character. You see, this is the he's he's not uh, specifically a colonial American. He's he is taken from West Africa, and uh, you'll hear um, sometimes there was a period where people were saying his book is not you know correct and it's it's been fudged and faked too much. But uh, the general consensus now is, and especially with some real good articles, is this is a real true book. He's taken from Africa. He's come over here. He gets involved in the Navy. So he's with the British Navy. And so this raises a fun aspect, fun, uh, a 
interesting aspect of the informality is he is on a on a ship it's incredibly hierarchical and the captain's power is is almost extreme there's a slight separations of power within the first mate and the captain and owners and stuff but ultimately at sea a captain at sea is a type of uh, absolute monarch and there's lots of discussion talk comes up in Richard Henry Dana of sailors being slaves. And so, so the slave status of Ulida Equiano on a British ship is not really clear and distinct. And so he's a steward, he's a type of servant of the officers, and at the same time, uh, he participates uh, in the same in the in the the structure of the boat in the same way as as everyone does. And uh, what happens, though, is he gets taken to London and they do not allow him to land in London uh, because uh, there on land, he could actually attain his freedom in various ways. He eventually gets educated. It's a complex story. You got to read it. It's a great story. But what, for what we're talking about is, is, is when you read Ulida Equiano, what you're seeing is the informality of, of the slave of existence and, and, and how blackness, Africanness is being thought of in a, in very unstructured ways. And so Ulida Aquiano, you know, very uh, interesting guy, eventually becomes free. Over here, he actually is a captain of a slave ship. And so he's a black captain, you know, taking slaves. Breen writes about uh, another book about a uh, the Eastern Chesapeake, in which slave, there are black people owning plantations of, you know, owning other slaves. So there's a lot of complexity to the informalities, all right? Now, let's get to the basic uh, Edmund S. Morgan argument, is, uh, is he sees, you know, when, in 1619, when you uh, bring people to Jamestown, and there's some women, there's whites, there's and then a shipload of blacks, they're, they're being sold under this informal sort of structure as indentured servants. That's the primary sort of way to legally understand it. And then uh, what he po points out is that as blacks and Indians and stuff get forced out to the frontier, along with uh, poor whites and such, there's a multi-ethnic rebellion called Bacon's Rebellion. And uh, blacks, whites, you know, they're Indians are side by side fighting uh, to uh, against the, the the governmental hierarchy down here in in Jamestown in the middle plantation. So what uh, happens is is that these guys get put down. You know they come down here, they burn down Jamestown, but the uh, revolt gets taken down, and so the government in the period of 1676 on through the next 30, 40, even 50 years, starts to develop codes, slave codes, in which these slave codes um, separate black and blackness and slavery gets tied to blackness and, and then you get these systems, uh, especially where you travel uh, your slave status as a in your the, your actual race your chattel your your character as chattelness uh, passes through the mother and so here's Thomas Jefferson's family this is his father-in-law and his father-in-law gives birth to his you know future wife or future wife here but then his uh, father-in-law is also uh, producing slaves because this woman's a slave. These children produced by him are slaves. She's free. So when Thomas Jefferson has, you know, uh, is tied to uh, this woman here, uh, they have some kids and they are free. And then with these kids here off of Sally Hemings, they are slave. And you see, that's a, that's, that, <laughs> that's an extreme sort of structured formal system being developed in the legislature. So back to the whole thing here is what we see is, is that um, a very distinctive form of slavery as a chattel system, as a, as a property system, as a racist, a sort of pre-racist genetic craziness 
tied to a specific, you know, the mother, mothers carries the, 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 the blackness, the slaveness. And uh, that is a legal structure created a sort of de jure legal structure. Let me go back to this. As you see, de jure is the formal structure by law. By law. De facto is sort of, you know, what happens, okay? And that's where you see a lot of informal slaveries. And so just keep this in mind and keep it tracking. What, what's going on in New England and Pennsylvania is very different from what's going on in, in Virginia. And of course, uh, we've done a lot to, uh, scholars have done a lot to develop and, and uh, you know, contradict and, and show that there's a lot of more complexity to it than just what Edmund Morgan was talking about. There's uh, the influence of Barbados, all sorts of other things too. So uh, with that though, let's just uh, point out that uh, in the 18th century, we do not have the sort of same structures of thought that are gonna lead into the Civil War. They are uh, going to evolve. And we'll talk about that evolution, especially as we move into the 1820s and some slavery freedom movements and stuff later, okay? All right, good. Keep. Keep going. I'm stuck in this spot. <laughs>